so today we are, um, um, I really, I really, um, really couldn't plan this stuff out better if I tried, um, but, uh, everything works out the way God wants it to work out, amen? Um, so we're picking back up today in, in John 17, uh, this is Jesus' prayer, uh, not the Lord's prayer, uh, that many of us have memorized. This is Jesus' prayer. This is Jesus actually praying, not teaching us how to pray. Um, I mentioned last week that this is, uh, in many ways, um, a peek behind the veil. We're able to see the Trinity actually communicating with each other. We're, we're able to see how uh, Jesus talks to the Father. We're able to hear that conversation. Uh, gives us a little insight into what's on Jesus' heart, what Jesus wants to see out of us. Um, and his understanding, um, you know, so, la- so last week we talked um, about um, that Jesus is here to, was, was here to glorify the Father. He was here to make the Father known in, in that sense. Um, and that, you know, before he's arrested, before he's crucified, before all that stuff, he says that he has accomplished, past tense, I have accomplished the work which you have given me to do. I've made your name known. I have glorified you on earth. Now, Father, glorify me. Um, and so we pick up in, in chapter, or, I'm sorry, verse 6 here. We'll go to 6 through 12 today. Um, we're, we're kind of picking up along that same vein. Jesus says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them, and they received them, and they understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one." While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. So the first word that jumped out there for me was, I have manifested your name, right? Um, <clears throat> now manifest, uh, we, we know, is, is you know, to, to make known, is to write something down, to, to spread it, people know it. It's a... Uh, um, you, you write a manifesto, it's to let people know who you are, what you believe, what you think. Um, but when I, when I looked that word up, one of the things, and it, and it means those things, but one of the other key parts to this word in the Greek that stood out is it's to make visible. It's to make known by making visible. So Jesus makes God known by making him visible. We're able to see God because we're able to see Jesus. And Jesus, as Paul says, is the perfect image of the invisible God. The author of Hebrews, the exact representation of his nature. As Jesus Christ says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because Jesus Christ has made God visible. Okay? And so, but what Jesus is talking about here is he's specifically talking about his disciples. And, um... You know, typically we say 12. There's actually more than 12 because, you know, the Bible being written by men and translated by men, we didn't feel that women had an adequate place, but Mary, Magdalene, and Martha were disciples. And they were just as credible as disciples in their time as Peter and Paul and James and the rest of them, right? So, but because men wrote this and we translated just the men, but there were more than, there were more than 12 because we know that Mary and Martha were disciples as well. But that's who he's talking about. You gave me this group of people. You gave them to me. They were yours. And they were in the world. And you took them out of the world and you gave them to me. And I told them who I was. I told them all about us. I told them about you. I told them about me. I showed them to you. I showed them me. And guess what? They believed that you sent me. They believed. 
And that's what we want to do, right? We believe, and we are Christians, because we believe that God sent His Son into the world, right? We believe that. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And that's what stands us apart from other faith traditions. Our Messiah showed up. And we have documentation from outside other Christian sources. You know, we have um, secular Roman documentations that talks about the guy Jesus of Nazareth that was crucified. Um, so we have historical evidence to support the fact that there was a guy named Jesus trolling around that area around this time. Okay, And then we tend to believe, because of the miracles and the stories in our faith, specifically the resurrection, right? that he was the Messiah. And we believe that God sent him. And it's because of that belief that we have what? We have eternal life. Right? Our lives are forever changed. The life that we have never ends. You know, I, I have, you know, one, and this is the, the, uh, the thing about my job that you never get used to. Um, you, 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 but it's such an honor and such a privilege. I always tell people, I love doing funerals. You never get used to them. It's never easy. But man, they're beautiful. They're amazing. You know, like um, when when Helen's husband uh, John passed away, getting to be the fact that I, when he was getting ready to walk away, I, I walked out of the room. The next thing I know, Jim comes back and Jim says, "Hey, my mom, my mom wants you in here." The fact that she wanted me there. That's a that's a pretty awesome privilege, right? And. Um, Oh, jeez. I just lost my train of thought there. Um, I know I was going somewhere good, uh, as I always do. Yeah, maybe. Did I know that, you know, because I, you know, I, I, I was on vacation this week, <laughs> supposedly. Um you know, Monday and Tuesday, Jessica and I were in Putin Bay. I come home from Putin Bay to find out that there was this police involved shooting. Uh, Wednesday, I had a, a, a meeting that I had set up before. It was the only thing I had to do this week. The only thing I had to do is I had a 11 o'clock meeting on Wednesday that I had to be at. Well, Wednesday morning, Jim called uh, about, I don't remember, maybe about 8 o'clock. And I remember thinking when he called, I was just getting out of the shower and getting dressed and uh, I was going to come out here and putz around for a little bit just to get away from the wife and kids. You know what I'm talking about, Jim. Um, <laughs> but uh, but so, so Jim Jim calls me, and, and I almost didn't answer it because I assumed Jim was just calling to see if I wanted to go to the wood shop for a couple hours. And I'm like, ah, there's no way I can go to the wood shop today. I'll just call him back later. And I was like, no, I'll just go ahead and tell him now. And, and by, I can tell when I answer the phone, this isn't about the wood shop. Right, and so you know, he tells me what's going on, and I said, "Okay, just you know, let me get some some stuff figured out here, and, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, we'll get it figured out." Well, a little while longer, he called me and says, "Hey, taking a real turn, and be taking off the machine. Lori really wants you here." So I stop what I'm doing, go up there, and I'm there with the family. They want me to pray, and, and it's just it's a privilege, right? But the best part about all of that, you know, when I look think about all the people in here who've lost somebody. That I know that as soon as John went to sleep, as soon as Cindy went to sleep, they just woke right back up. And they woke up in the presence of the Father, completely healed, because they had eternal life. And so um, that's what the disciples are, are trying to get us to understand. They're trying to get us to believe that He sent Him. And if we can believe that, if we believe that, no matter what happens, our life never ends. It never ends. It goes on forever. And 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 lucky for us, this is this is where where it really gets interesting. Every single one of us that's in this room today, we are here because of the disciples. Every single person that has ever taught you anything about Jesus Christ is a disciple of the disciples. Right? They went out. Jesus gave them the Great Commission. Go out into the world, baptizing and creating... Uh, oh, Jesus. 
somebody help me out. Go out into the world baptizing and some, something. I can't believe I can't remember that right now off the top of my head. But anyway, um, let's find it. Now it's going to bother me. I'll be laying in bed night. What was that again? Uh, Matthew 24, I think. Sometimes you get these. There it is, Matthew 27. Um, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So because of that, these disciples became apostles, and they went out. And then, you know, Judas you know, had his issues, and so he didn't get to go out. But then they got Paul, and, and now Paul went out, and Paul had his own disciples. And the people who followed Paul, and then they carried that on. And then they had their disciples, and then they carried that on. And then eventually one of them discipled a guy named Roy Kelsey, who then discipled a guy named Ed Wishart, who then discipled a guy named Jim Thornton. And then all of us have been discipled by, most of us probably Ed Wishart, right? Um, but most of us have been discipled by somebody who is discipled by somebody who is discipled by somebody who is discipled by the disciples. Now, the problem is is that what we've done is we played this 2,000-year game of telephone, right? And sometimes things get a little bit lost in translation. But the key element that Jesus is pointing to here, and the, the key thing that he... Because this is, this is Jesus' prayer. And at this point in time in the prayer, he's praying for the disciples. And what does he pray for? He says that they may be one even... As we are one. So here's the God, right? You got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they are one. They are so in sync that there's no distinction between the three of them. That they are one God because they're three people that are so united, so in unity, that they hold all things together. Right? And they're praying that we, as the disciples of the disciples of the disciples, and that those disciples and our disciples and all the disciples will be one even as we are one. So Jesus believes. Jesus believes. Because once again, if Jesus is, is praying, you can probably go ahead and believe that he believes it. Jesus is praying that we will be one even as they are one. We can be as united as human beings, as the church, the body of Christ. We can be as united as the very Trinity that created us. And this not only is possible, it's our goal. This is what we should be striving for. And this is why sometimes as a Christian, it gets extremely frustrating when I see Christians continue to support people whose sole purpose is to divide, to cause disunity, to cause chaos. That's not who we are. Our job is not to pick sides. Our job is not to, you know, because when I, we look at what happened this week, right? We had police at the community meeting on, on Thursday, on Wednesday. The police were not able to get up and speak on camera because they can't speak on an ongoing investigation. They can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody and tell them what they know, right? They can do that. They can't make an official statement because they can't compromise an ongoing investigation. So what we know is that there were men in the car. The car had just been reported to have been at the scene of another shooting in Elyria. Right? So we can go ahead and assume that there's a weapon in the car. Um, they failed to follow commands. They were moving around in the car. Where were they? Were they trying to hide something? Where were they trying to come up with a game plan? We don't know. And if you've seen the Facebook Live video, it's on Facebook, everything, the whole thing was caught on camera, as always, um, except for the body cams and dash cams, because apparently Elyria can't afford those. But a man opened the door, and he stepped out, and he stepped out, and he had a gun in his hand. He was shot. That's what we know. The gun was recovered, the man died. We know this. So, the investigation is going to conclude, I don't, I can <laughs> I have zero police skills or police knowledge or police training, and I can do this investigation. It was justified. Now, it was justified according to the law. Now, my personal ethic, 
no cop is ever justified to shoot anybody. And that's just my own personal ethic, because I don't think anybody is ever justified in shooting anybody, right? I'm, I, I don't own a gun, and I'm not going to own a gun, because if I own a gun, then why own a gun if I'm not going to use a gun, right? And I don't ever believe it's my job to put, ever do anything that's going to take somebody's life, no matter what they are doing to me, okay? No matter what you're doing to my family or to me, I'm never going to take somebody's life. That's just my personal ethic. Right? So I don't believe a cop is ever justified in shooting anybody. And I'm so thankful that I'm never going to be a cop and I'm never going to be in that situation where I have to make that decision. And I pray for those cops that they do. Right? And I know, and I, I, I didn't, I've never heard the names of those police officers. I've never met them. And I didn't even know their names until I saw them printed in the paper and the names didn't even sound familiar. But I can guarantee you, I promise you, when those cops woke up that morning, the last thing they wanted to have happen was what would have happened. They did not wake up hoping they got to shoot a black guy that day. That's not what they wanted. They wanted, their, they wanted that day to be just as routine as every other day. I know cops, and I talk to cops, and, and they say, my hope is that I just have the boring shift every shift. I hope every shift is just boring, because I don't ever want to be put in a situation where I have to make a life and death decision, right? But now... We know, we know some facts, and there's some facts that we know that we don't know yet because they haven't been published. So now it's easy for me to pick a side and say, see, the cops are justified, they did what was right, I'm picking a side. But yet it's also easy for me to be a member of a community that's had a lot of problems, has had a lot of different circumstances that they've had to face. And here's another one of their brothers and sisters and cousins who's dead. Right? You know what the mom, the mom that I spoke to, one of her biggest complaints was? Is that when her, when her son went to prison, he got it. Because once again, both of these guys, both the guys that got shot and died, both of them had extensive rap sheets. Right? These are, these are guys that had multiple numbers. They'd been in prison at least, I think at least twice. She said her biggest, her biggest frustration is not that the police shot her son. It's that the community didn't have anything for her son when he got out of prison. We didn't have anything for him to, 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 to change his life. And we know, I mean, Ann knows, Phil knows, prisons give people the ability to rehabilitate, but prisons by nature don't rehabilitate. If you're in prison and you want to change your life while in prison, you can. But the prison isn't going to make you change your life. And when guys get out of prison, and this is one of the, the missions of our church, one of the things that we've tried our hardest to do is to be there for guys when they get out of prison. reason why we have guys come here from prison twice a year is so we can begin to build relationships with them so when they get out of prison, they have somebody they can call. They have a, a, a little bit of a safety net. But this mom, hearing this mom talk about this, because if the community had some sort of program or something that could have helped her son, he wouldn't have been in that situation to begin with. So it's not a police killing black people problem. It's a systemic problem of, of what are we doing to help people who have been put in these situations to help change their lives so they can get out of the situations that they're in. Right? So I can, now I can go ahead and I can side with the family and say, yes, you're right. But guess what I just did? I picked a side. Our job is not to pick sides, because if I pick a side, I'm either going to win or I'm going to lose, and the other side is either going to win or going to lose. And this is my, one of my biggest frustrations when I look at what's going on in the world. There was a point in time when Barack Obama was president, and Barack Obama had control of Congress, well, the Democrats had control of Congress, and they had control of the Senate, and they had control of the White House. And what did they accomplish? They passed the absolute worst health care bill to ever get passed. The word, I mean, I mean, there might be some that, that have enjoyed Obamacare, but by and large, even Democrats realized that it, it, it was a failure. And, and anybody who's not a Democrat says, that's the worst health care bill to ever pass. My premium shut up, prescription shut up, I had to change my doctor, it was terrible. But we had one party rule. It should, they, they had no opposition. This should have been the best bill ever passed. But it was one sided. One side won, one side lost. Not a single Republican voted for it. And I don't believe any Democrats voted against it. I might be wrong there. 
I think there might have been two Democrats that voted against it. I can't remember. I know Dennis Kucinich was, and he went on the plane with Obama, and then he voted for it. But I think there might have been still two that voted against it. But either way. And then there was a point in time when Donald Trump, the Republican, President of the United States, he had, the Republicans had full control of Congress, they had full control of the Senate, and they had control of the White House. What did they do? They passed the single worst tax bill in the history of our country. Once again, they have no opposition. Nothing can stop it. Right? One side won, one side lost. If you're rich, you won, if you made out, right? Jeff Bezos loves the new tax plan. I got about four or five hundred dollars less than I usually get, and I'm getting audited. Because, you know, Jeff Bezos makes 17 billion dollars, pays zero in tax, and gets 14 million dollars in returns. That's fine. Jim Thornton makes 30,000 dollars a year, gets a 700 dollar return. We better audit that. Right? Wonderful tax plan. Um, right now, in the state of Ohio, the state of Ohio, right, we have a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and a Republican governor. One of the only constitutional mandates that the, 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 the House and the Senate have is every two years they have to pass a budget. They failed. They didn't pass a budget by the June, July 1st deadline. Why? They have one party. Well, there's no opposition. <laughs> they put whatever they want to put in it, and it's going to pass. They're going to get it done. Right? This is what happens when we have sides. Right? The objective and the object the reason why the founding fathers constructed our government the way they constructed it is so that way we would have opposition and it wouldn't be one side rule. It would be two sides coming together, working together to find a solution that works for all people. Right? And this is what we're to be doing. This is what our job as Christian people is to be bringing unity. Not to be picking a side. Not to be being a conservative or a liberal or a Republican or a Democrat. Being Black Lives Matter, Top Lives Matter. Our job as Christians is just to be Christians and to stand in the middle and saying, how about you come here and you come here and we have a conversation. And this is... I'm not endorsing anybody because I can't. <laughs> But this, is, but this is what I love about, about Frank Whitfield. Frank Whitfield's biggest problem this week, and if you don't know, well, you should actually know Frank Whitfield. Frank Whitfield has been here. He's spoken in our church. He's been a friend of mine for a long time. Um, he was on the forum one time. Um, if Frank Whitfield wasn't a, a mayor, a candidate for mayor in Elyria, he still would have done everything he did this week. His problem is people thinking that the reason why he's doing it is because he's running for mayor. But what did Frank do? The very first thing, as soon as this incident happened on Tuesday, he said, we're going to have a community meeting tomorrow. And he planned it, and he organized it, and he brought people together. And the very thing he said is, we're not here to pick a side. If you want to go and protest, go and protest. That's your constitutional right. He had the cops there. And he said, we want to come together as a community. We're not here to pick a side. We're here to bring our, bring our community who's hurting, who's gone through this traumatic event, and we want to bring this community together. This is the objective. And, 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 and why does somebody like that do that? Because he's a Christian man. His, his goal is unity because he reads the scriptures just like I do and just like you do. And he reads these words about that wish that they will be one even as we are one. And this isn't the, the only time that Jesus is going to say this in this prayer. Being one as they are one is obviously on Jesus' mind. And so as Christian people who are living in this world today, what is our job? What is our goal? What is our responsibility? Our responsibility is to be people who strive for unity, who stop picking sides, who stop wanting to win or lose, but is going to call people together and say, let's come together and let's work together to find a solution. Because the perfect utopia, because once again, please understand, Republicans aren't right. Democrats aren't right, right? Men aren't right, and women aren't right. Black people aren't right, and white people aren't right. 
What is right is people who believe different, think different, look different, act different, come together and work together in a spirit of unity. The reason why we have people of all different colors, all different ideologies, all different sexual orientations is so we can come together as one and say, look how different we are. Let's stand up and be one. Right? And this is where I... You guys have heard me say this before. My biggest frustration is when we talk about America as a great melting pot. That's a terrible analogy. Because you put all this stuff into a melting pot, you heat it up really, 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 really hot to it all melts down and becomes one big giant thing. Right? That's, that's not what our country is. Our country is, is a salad, right? Where each one of us, each, each ethnic group, each sexual orientation, each religion, each gender has its own element in the salad. And you, you know, we can look at what the majority of salad is lettuce. The majority of our country is white, so white people are the lettuce. We'll let the Latinx community be the peppers because they have a little bit of spice, right? Another ethnic group is, is the crouton. Somebody gets to be the cheese. We'll let well, the Italians can be the cheese, right? You know what I mean? But inside of that salad, when all these ingredients of the salad are added together, they make this delicious plate of food, but each element in the salad maintains its own identity, but they blend together as one salad. That's what we're supposed to be as the church. That's what we're supposed to be as God's people. It's all coming together, different ideologies, different ways of seeing the world, and still saying, you know what, we're going to taste delicious. And we're going to have unity with us. You know, this, and, and this isn't the job of the United States of America. This isn't the job of, of Mexico or Great Britain or Germany. This is the job of the church. This is our job. Nations are supposed to build borders. Nations are supposed to keep people in and keep people out. That's what nations do. That's why we're not supposed to align ourselves with nations. We're supposed to align ourselves with the kingdom. Because the kingdom stands for unity. This kingdom stands for inclusion. The kingdom says, Father God, I pray that my disciples will be one even as you and I are one. And so we can point to all the divisions in our world. There's a reason why I played that song at the beginning. Let the world continue to try to divide. That's what Satan does. The first thing Satan did was try to divide Adam and Eve from the garden. And he succeeded. And he's constantly been trying to divide people from God ever since. God's, job, God's objective is always to unify. And so if you're standing up and supporting somebody who wants to try to divide people, you're not standing on the side of God. If you stand up for somebody who's looking to try to unify people, who's trying to bring people together, who's trying to heal hurts, mend broken hearts, stand up for the people who have been excluded and bring them part of the team as well, you're standing on the side of God. Because when, when Jesus prays, when Jesus speaks to, to the Father, when the Trinity communicates, that's what they ask for. John 17 is a very unique chapter because it allows us to see what the Trinity is praying for. We can stand up here and we can pray, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not degrading, but we can pray for people's dogs, and we can pray, just, I mean, heaven, if I tell Karen we can't pray for dogs in church anymore, we'll never see Karen again. Let's pray for dogs. Dogs need prayer. You know what I mean? We can pray for rain. We can pray for, for people struggling with cancer. We can pray for a lot of things. What does Jesus pray for? Jesus prays for us to be united. Jesus prays for us to be one as they are one. Jesus is praying that we will believe that God sent him. Jesus is praying that we will recognize that he has made God visible to us. This is what he's praying for. So maybe we should pay attention to what he's praying for. Yep, let's keep praying for Aunt Sally and, and Toto who, you know, burned his paw on the pavement or whatever. Let's keep having those prayers. Those prayers are important. But let's also pay attention and pray for what Jesus is praying for. Unity. 
One of the things I said a long time ago is the objective is, from my objective, is to help us find unity in our diversity. I would love to have a diverse church. I would love to have people of all different backgrounds and races and everything in our church. Because that's how we really know we're united, is when we all are different. And not just because some are old and some are young. I didn't mean to point to Loretta, but that was an accident. I apologize. <laughs> so we need. I do. I do. So. So. One of the things that I look for, and one of the things that I hope to be, is that I want to look for leaders that are going to try to unite people. And once again, I'm not endorsing him because I can't. But that's why I look at people like Frank Whitfield and what he's trying to do. His campaign is called We Lyria because it's about unity. It's about bringing the community together, the south side and the north side, the white side and the black side. You know what I mean? What I try to do as a pastor is be a pastor that helps unite people, bring people together, help, find, help people find, help people who have been told that they're excluded find their inclusion. So I want to strive to be like that because I'm, I'm reading this prayer and I want to be what Jesus wants me to be as one of his disciples. And I want to be somebody that strives to be one even as they are one. And sometimes that means pointing out things that maybe you don't want me to point out. But it's about helping us change the way we see. Not picking sides but standing up for and with people that have made it their life's mission to bring unity inside of our communities, to bring unity inside of our churches, to bring unity inside of our world. Amen?